Dr. Kroger, we are so happy to have you with us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce our Department of Navy's first Chief Learning Officer, Dr. John Kroger. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for uh, coming together. Um, so I'm gonna talk about 10 minutes this morning and then save the whole rest of the time that we've got for questions. Um, and hopefully we can have a really robust dialogue, talk about whatever uh, people wanna talk about. Um, so the main reason I'm here is to just give you a heads up that on Monday, the Secretary of the Navy is gonna be releasing our first ever comprehensive Navy and Marine Corps joint naval education strategy. So um, it is called Education for Sea Power Strategy 2020. It's dated on the assumption that we'll constantly update this strategy as we learn more and we, we react to events on the ground. Um, what I wanna do for a few moments this morning is just talk about a few of, of what I think um, maybe the most important impacts of the strategy uh, on the Naval War College and its role in uh, Navy and Marine Corps education. So I'm gonna highlight a couple big picture things and uh, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, the secretary is gonna send out one of his vectors tomorrow that um, announces the strategy is coming on Monday and it's gonna highlight what uh, is most important from the secretary's perspective about this new educational effort. So um, you may wanna keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, I actually only have one copy of the strategy. It's the, it's the very first that was printed and um, Admiral uh, Chatfield now has it. I, I, I have to say she has the Secretary of the Navy's copy. So uh, um, if he comes asking for it, you'll have to cough it up. Uh, so um, here's the big picture thought underlying the Naval Education Strategy. Um, it is a result of the 2018-2019 self-study that the Navy and Marine Corps did, the Education for Sea Power report. And it's really driven by an awareness of the changing geopolitical position of the United States. So uh, if we go back to 1990, um, one year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, two things were true about the United States Armed Forces. One is that they were backed overwhelmingly by the largest economy in the world. Right, so in 1990, the United States was, was by far the largest economy in the world. Our two closest economic peers were, China, uh, were Japan and Germany, which were both close allies. Um, it meant that we really had massive economic power. Um, the other thing that was true is we had technological capabilities unlike those possessed by any other force in the world. And we saw that in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, right? It was this public unveiling of a military capability unlike anything anyone else had um, which gave us complete dominance in the military space. Fast forward today, both of those massive advantages have narrowed, they've eroded, they've closed. Um, so uh, thinking about the size of the American economy, when I ask audiences what's the largest economy in the world, everyone instinctively says the United States. And the truth of the matter is there's two different ways, primary ways, you measure GDP, and in one of them, the United States is the largest economy in the world, and the other, China is the largest economy in the world. Uh, the basic point being that uh, they are an economic peer. And the reason that should matter to us is, is if you look historically, there are very few examples where military strength ultimately hasn't been a function of underlying economic strength. Um, if you're thinking of this in naval terms, um, Professor Kennedy's study of the Royal Navy um, through its history, one of the fundamental conclusions of that book was it was just impossible to sustain the Royal Navy's military power at a time when the economic power of the UK was declining relative to other societies. So insofar as right, uh, uh, military power is a function of economics, the fact that, that that margin is narrowed should be a matter of concern to us. The other area where we've really lost a lot of advantage is technology. 
Um, the Department of Defense released a study a couple months ago. It identified five key technologies that are important for the future of armed conflict. And it, it noted that in those five areas, China is equal to us in technological capability or has surpassed us. There's things like 5G networks, hypersonic missile technology, uh, energy storage and batteries. Basic components of 21st century warfare, our advantage is not nearly as strong as it was back in 1990. So what does this mean for us? The basic conclusion of the Education for Sea Power report and what we're affirming in the strategy that will come out on Monday is that in a world where the United States no longer has massive economic and technological advantage, where we're really dealing with potential peer adversaries for the first time in 30 years, we're going to have to be able to outthink opponents in order to outfight them. And so the whole goal of the strategy is to up our game in the Navy and Marine Corps around education. Uh, obviously, the Naval War College is, is positioned to play a very key role in this strategy. So I want to talk a little bit about what may change over the next five years as a result of the strategy if we're successful. So one very simple thing to say is we need to send more officers to more graduate education. And we need to do that in ways that are directly tied to our warfighting capability. So, uh, and this is a challenge. So to put it in rough terms, and the strategy does this, every year right now, um, we have about 2.7% of our US Navy officers in graduate education of some sort. And we need to increase that number significantly. So what you're going to see, hopefully, is more officers who are attending here at the War College. Uh, you're going to see more officers going to the Naval Postgraduate School. You're going to see more officers doing, going to graduate programs and civilian education programs uh, that are directly related to capabilities we need. So you're going to see a big increase in the number of people who are getting educated. And it's not just us. It's going to be our, our foreign partners and allies, too. Um, so the Secretary of Defense uh, recently called for a 50% increase in the number of partner and allied officers attending U.S. military schools. Um, a big chunk of those students are going to come here um, because this is, is, is by far one of the most globally respected uh, of our institutions. So point one, increase in the number of students. The second thing I would say is how we educate those students is going to change. Um, we are going to be doing a lot more of what we traditionally do, which is in-residence education, students coming full-time to places like the War College um, to spend uh, a period of time fully devoted to their education. But the truth of the matter is we're not going to be able to educate at the level we need if we rely solely on traditional in-residence education. So you're going to see two things called out in the strategy. One is we're going to create a new mid-career curriculum for Navy and Marine Corps officers. Um, the way to think about it is, is, is this, right? If you think about a, an education for a military officer having a, a component uh, of a great undergraduate education and then hopefully a capstone senior strategic education uh, here at the War College or at a place like SICE, what happens in the middle? The Marine Corps has a very well-developed mid-career uh, uh, program for 03s, 04s, 05s. Um, the Navy, it's a little bit more hit and miss. And so we're going to create a new fully online mid-career warfighting curriculum uh, that will reach officers wherever they are in the world. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that the War College faculty will play a role in designing what this thing looks like. We're also going to be doing more low residence education. Um, and, and low residence education has kind of exploded in civilian higher education. I want to take a little bit of time and talk about what, it, what it's like. And the simplest way to do that is just tell you my, my personal experience with it. Um, uh, my wife went to a low residence doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania. And the reason 
we decided she would do a low residence degree program. It's like many people in the armed services, she could not take full time off from her duty station to go get a degree. Um, every time she thought about going to grad school, she got promoted. Um, she was deeply committed to her career. She was doing amazing things in her career. She needed an educational option that didn't require her to take full time off from her job. So uh, we signed up for the program at the University of Pennsylvania. She was on campus three days a month during the period of her education. And I'll be honest with you, when we signed up for it, I, I think as both of us are educators, I've been a classroom teacher my whole life, um, somewhat skeptical about it. Um, uh, and the, the honest answer is uh, it was a transformational intellectual experience. Um, it was not less work. Uh, it was a massive amount of work. And most of the work went on when she was not on campus, right? So when she was not on campus, she was communicating with faculty. She was meeting with her cohort online. She was doing a lot of work. But then she came together with her cohort three days a, a month um, to tie it all together and to push forward with the next set of learning objectives. We're not gonna be able to meet our goals of educating more naval officers unless we have options like low residency for people to get educated in their duty stations. So uh, you're gonna see over the, over the next couple of years um, greater emphasis on that. And it'll be a question for, for this community to figure out whether they want to try to build some low residency programs here on campus. Uh, a, th a, th a third thing I'd point out um, is really aimed at the, at, at the enlisted force. Uh, and it's in some ways, I think, from the Secretary of the Navy's perspective, a, a signature of the Naval strategy is a new Naval Community College for the enlisted force. Um, so uh, we are moving forward very quickly to develop that. We're gonna have the first cohort of enlisted students in the Naval Community College um, in January of 2021. Um, we've got cohorts uh, that we're working on forming from the intelligence community, from the nuclear program, and from uh, the Marine Corps and Navy's IT communities. Um, and they're gonna be going to technical associates degree programs in IT, in cyber, in data analytics, and in engineering. And I wanna point that out because for our enlisted folks who are here um, assigned to the school, um, if you've not had a chance to pursue an associate's degree and lay the foundation for your career, the community college is gonna be available to do that. Uh, the last thing I wanna point out, how many of you are civilian civil service folks? Okay, tons, right? Um, a lot of you are already very far along with your education, um, but one of the things the report calls out is a recognition that uh, the glue that holds the Navy and Marine Corps together is our, is, our, is our civil service workforce. And we have not done enough um, to support the education and professional development of that group. And so um, we're gonna be doing a couple of things. First, we're going to have um, in our first cohort of students going through the Naval Community College, we're gonna have um, civil servants, uh, civilians in that cohort as well. And interestingly, this was a request directly from the Marine Corps. Um, they have in the IT world teams of Marines working with civil servants side by side and they need both of them trained together. So the community college, as it scales up, um, we're gonna try to make available to as many of our civilian force uh, as possible. And second, we're gonna be supporting the graduate education of mid-career managers in the civilian workforce as well. Um, so the secretary has authorized a new program to send mid-level managers to get master's degrees, uh, MBAs in management, finance, re financial resources management, um, which is by far, I think, the single biggest strength that we need to, to, to boost up. All this comes together um, in what is a strategy to try to lift every, the educational level of every single element of our force. The first pillar of the strategy is to educate continuously our entire force officers and enlisted military and civilian. It's a pretty bold and ambitious effort. Um, it's one that the secretary is really committed to. It's one that um, in conversations with Congress has been very well received so far. Um, it's going to take additional resources. Uh, the secretary has already ordered uh, additional resources for the War College, 
uh, for this year and for next, and we're working very closely with the Admiral to make sure that the promised money shows up on time in ways that you can actually use it, um, which is always a challenge in our system. But overall, I'm really excited about the vision of the strategy. It's a recognition that uh, in our current geopolitical environment, our single biggest potential advantage is the quality of our people. Like that's the things that, that makes the Navy and Marine Corps special. And if we wanna take full advantage of that, we have to take our educational and professional development more seriously uh, with a more intentional and more focused effort. So the strategy will be out Monday and I'm hoping people will uh, take a look at it. And like I said, it's gonna be an iterative document. Um, I suspect we will update it yearly both to report on what progress or lack of progress we're making, uh, but also to incorporate new ideas and what we've learned as we try to increase uh, the effectiveness of education um, across the services.